Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take data and we use it to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, the data point we want to address this week is 36. That is the ranking of South Africa among all the countries of the world in terms of its GDP, gross domestic product. That makes it a success story and an extraordinary one given its history of apartheid, its decade-long system of enforced racial discrimination. That's produced a legacy of inequality, though that's still evident today across the country's politics, but also its economy. We thought we'd dig in to see exactly what kind of success story South Africa is these days. So, Adam, South Africa, for a long time, was included in the pretty common economic acronym BRICS. This is a group of emerging markets that was grouped together, including Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa being the S there at the end of BRICS. You don't see that being cited so often these days, but did that group ever really make sense as a coherent entity? Well, it was a it was a notion coined by um, Goldman Sachs's uh, chief economist at the time, Jim O'Neill, um, in two thousand and one, and they did a big report in two thousand and three. And originally, it was brick with a little s on the end, mm. so it was Brazil, Russia, India, China, and the s was just to sort of make it more pronounceable. But the two thousand and three report actually includes a box about the question of why. There's no African country and whether South Africa ought to be added to the list because what O'Neill was interested in was not just these countries as investment propositions, but really in thinking through the structure of the global economic governance and how the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, which were products of the post-World War II moment, were increasingly obsolete in a world which had to face events like the Asian financial crises of the late 1990s and that needed structures of governance that actually represented a much larger slice of the world and an increasingly significant slice of the world economy. And so the concept of BRICS was always as, to some extent, political, or you might say geoeconomic, as it was um, strictly economic. You know, and if if you look at it, you could say, you know, does South Africa really belong? But but you could hardly say that, you know, by this by by comparison with the other countries, it's particularly odd looking in the company that it was placed in there, right? The, I mean, clearly the standout case is is China, which mm. has experienced this, you know, truly radical economic growth, which has transformed, you know, the planet circumstances up to and including the the balance of the climate equation, for instance. Russia is a you know a former Cold War superpower with a huge nuclear arsenal and is in otherwise an economy very heavily dependent on fossil fuels. India is a huge energy importer. You know it's it's a pretty it's a pretty incongruous group. The mm. significance was that they were all big players in this new post post Cold War world, and I think given South Africa's somewhat diminished standing today, it's worth emphasizing that point that. South Africa in the 1990s and the early 2000s was a huge story, right? Because this question of whether the most sophisticated, the richest economy in in Africa could provide the platform for a post-apartheid polity and a post-apartheid society was was hugely important. Given the salience of of the anti-apartheid struggle in the 70s and 80s, not just in Africa, but but globally, it was one, one of the great global causes of that era. And so I think to that extent, it's not surprising that South Africa, people wanted to include it. It's not surprising either that South Africa was included in the G20 when it came to constructing that organization, which was also a kind of makeshift effort to create a set of global structures that were not as narrow as the IMF and the World Bank, but not as broad and cumbersome as the UN General General Assembly. So 30 years now after the end of apartheid, in what ways is South Africa's black community a legibly disadvantaged group still? Or has the group itself been bifurcated into privileged and oppressed subgroups? I mean, the, the, the important thing to say is that South Africa is an overwhelmingly black nation, society, and state. I mean, according to the recent census, it was 80% black. So to speak of 
black South mm. Africans as a group is a rather odd, odd way mm. of formulating it. Certainly, the reverse is certainly true, that white South Africans who make up about 8% of the country and so-called colours, which is the apartheid era phrase for people of mixed race who make up about 9% and Indian South Africans, Asian South Africans who make up about 2.5%, they are all in various ways visibly advantaged groups or minorities. Of course, you know, I, I'm nitpitting to a degree because it's also true that that in modern South Africa and in present day South Africa, it's black people who live in shanty style townships, um, you know, in, in, in houses made of wood boards and corrugated iron dwellings with improvised electricity and, you know, and standpipe water supply. Uh, that is not something that very many white South Africans, if any at all, experience. In fact, I, when I was there, I watched sitcoms which involved various types of fantasy experiment in which Boer white men found themselves suddenly living in townships. I mean, it's a, a situation so incongruous that it that it creates a sort of slightly surreal impression. It's the black population that have to commute huge distances from these townships to whatever jobs are available in the cities. It's the black population that suffers the crushing levels of unemployment and experiences inferior, much inferior schooling. But the black population itself is segmented and segmented along lines of class, for sure. There is now a substantial black middle class and a extraordinarily affluent black upper class. Um, part of that is an inherited aristocratic structure um, but part of that is to do with the politicized contacts in business and politics that center on the ANC in particular. But there are also deep divides in terms of ethnic and cultural divisions. If you spend any time in South Africa, you rapidly realize that it's a, it's a majority minority society in terms of ethnic and cultural groups. Once you look past the question of black and white, the, you know, and the important thing, of course, since the population is 80% black are the divisions within the black population. So Zulu is spoken... Um, by about 25% of the population. Hoso is spoken by about 16%. You know, English comes in as the third or fourth, the, the, you know, the language of the, of the white and colored population comes in at about 10% of all languages spoken in South Africa. So we're talking about a society divided multiply along lines of class, along lines of race, and then within the black population along ground, lines of ethnicity, and culture. The most important divide of all is between South African blacks and migrants who make up about 5 to 7% of the population, have come to South Africa attracted by its relative stability and relative prosperity from Zimbabwe, from Mozambique, from as far away as Nigeria, and are seriously discriminated against in terms of legal status, housing, work opportunities, and live in fear of pogroms. So in 2022, 2019, 2015, 2008, there were... Uh, waves of violent attacks and assaults on this migrant population. So does South Africa's continued struggles with inequality affect its overall economic performance? And if that is the case, uh, through what mechanisms does that, does that happen? I mean, this is a really quite fundamental conceptual question because you know, the apartheid era was one in which the South African economy modernized, but it was one based on exploitation and massive disadvantage. And so the question that's posed today is, is whether in a sense, you know, a more equal society is one that can grow fast, as fast even as the old apartheid era hierarchical system. There's a really deep question here as to what we think the motives of economic growth are and I think, you know, you don't have to be a liberal to believe that the answer should be and is that South Africa's inequality is in fact a crushing burden for its overall economic performance. And it does not in any substantial way enhance the economic potential of this society. The fact that a certain sort of modernization was achieved under conditions of massive inequality does not imply a causal connection. Um the most basic level, one of the most profound sources of inequality in South Africa is unemployment. And it's quite clear, obviously, that if somewhere between 30 and 40% of the population are unemployed, this is a huge loss of output. It's a huge loss of output, and it's a considerable drain on the state's finances because uh, the South African state provides a relatively capacious basic welfare system um, which drains funds which could otherwise be spent on investment. I mean, one shouldn't exaggerate this drain, but at the margin, of course, the question is, would you rather be supporting somebody 
who is struggling to find employment? Or would you rather be investing in the sort of capital stock and infrastructure that would enable people to be productive? It's quite clear that the lack of infrastructure, the struggle to maintain inadequate power supply and so on holds back um, entrepreneurship. And one of the really striking things about South Africa for a society which um, is at its stage of development is quite how small the small-scale agricultural system is as a contribution to GDP. It's you know less than 3% of South African GDP comes from agriculture, which is remarkably low for a country where you have so many people living on the boundary of poverty. You, you would want a vibrant entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial agricultural sector to which people could retreat. But broadly speaking, the, the central argument of any kind of liberal theory of growth is, of course, that a poor society consumes less, it provides less market for economic growth. And so clearly, a society that was more comprehensively prosperous would also be one that enabled growth um, and, and, and didn't challenge profit. Profit, to this extent, is not dependent on inequality. It's not dependent necessarily on on exploitation which produces massive uh, poverty and deprivation. At some level, it may, of course, it's trivially true that an employer that pays their workers less earns a higher degree of profit. But it's not obvious that 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 encourages greater overall growth in an economy. And it's it's not by accident that in the 1980s, big business was one of the major forces in white South Africa pushing for an end to the apartheid regime. That had cultural origins. Part of it, the the, the business elite was was English speaking rather than Boer, less committed to the Africana apartheid project. They were also desperately afraid of social unrest. They were afraid that in revolutionary circumstances, a socialist inspired ANC would seize power. They were hampered by the international boycott. But there was also a consideration that a less unequal, more uh, integrated society would be more prosperous and would offer better long-run prospects for economic growth. Okay, well, we'll be back right after the break to talk some more about the economy of South Africa. Welcome back. We're talking about the economy of South Africa which in some ways has been a surprising success story since the end of apartheid. In other ways, it's still struggling. So, Adam, as I got into the details of the South African economy, it struck me that it seems to have had great success at selling commodities and also at relatively sophisticated financial services, but then less so at manufacturing and I suppose also at agriculture, as you just mentioned. So is that an unusual combination, you know, the seeming combination of high and low goods and services that those commodities and financial services without that middle economic layer of manufacturing? It's a really interesting question. I mean, there's nothing particularly odd about mining and financial services going together. I mean, banking and mining go back to the age of imperialism, they were really born together in South Africa in that connection Um, because the modern South African economy really comes into existence with the discovery of gold and diamonds, which really supercharged the growth, particularly of the region around Johannesburg. Um, Mining is very, very capital intensive, so you need banks and the links have been tight. Anglo-American, you know, is the sort of um, the exemplar of this kind of vision of highly capitalist, very large scale um, development. Um, the question is, however, can you have a diversified economy alongside such a system of mining and finance? Um, this is a question you can ask across much of the, the British Empire. In fact, Australia has a similar kind of combination. Um, the risk is that if you develop um, a mining industry, um, you know, a highly competitive global export, what it does is to crowd out the rest of the economy. This is the so-called phenomenon of Dutch disease, which is an example taken from the Netherlands where the export of natural gas drove up the value of the Dutch currency and made it very difficult for anyone else to earn money exporting. Um, the striking thing about South Africa actually is that as a relatively closed economy, 
during the era of apartheid with a vested interest in self-sufficiency, it actually had, by any standard, a relatively high percentage of manufacturing in its economy. It peaked at about 25, somewhat over 25% in the early 1980s. And it's now down to 11%. So for, for in the, at the late stage, in the high point of apartheid, the South African economy was relatively diversified. And it still, to a considerable extent, maintains that balance. As the economy has grown and it's grown considerably, that 11% share represents a a, a, a total volume of output, which is not actually radically declining. The car manufacturing remains a significant sector in South Africa. I think this question of manufacturing haunts us as much as it does because of the way in which manufacturing jobs promised employment and the possibility of perhaps technological development and productivity change. South Africa, for instance, had, you know, largely self-sufficient, relatively, you know, at least mid-tech armament sector, which which was for a while an export champion, uh, one of the economic legacies of the apartheid, the militant militarist apartheid regime. All of that has crumbled away. And um, South Africa is now in a position not unlike, say, Brazil, for instance, which also in the 60s, 70s and 80s had a relatively large manufacturing sector, which has now diminished. So the point is, I think, that for a while at least, it seemed to have escaped the pressure of Dutch disease. In the recent decades, the share of manufacturing has definitely declined. But I think the question we have to ask is how far that's specific to South Africa and whether that's not in large part essentially the result of Chinese competition, which has changed the game for everyone in the manufacturing sector across the entire world. Hmm. So for all its economic successes, as you've mentioned in passing, South Africa these days is struggling to generate enough power to even run the country. So what kind of economic problems exactly are at work here? From what I can tell, it doesn't seem like these are market failures. It's not really a matter of insufficient investment per se or you know, kind of failures of supply and demand for fuel, but rather kind of issues of sabotage and corruption in the power industry. So what does this tell us about the overall South African economy? Yeah, ESCOM is a, is a real disaster. And if you spend any time in South Africa now, you you live that disaster on a daily basis. When we were trying to record a podcast from mm. South Africa, when I was there a couple of weeks ago, we actually, you know, we had to stop and start because the power went out in mid in mid recording. And this was in a, you know, fancy hotel in the middle of Joburg on, you know, a Wednesday morning or whenever it was. I mean, it's tragic because South Africa has by far the most sophisticated and extensive power grid on the African continent. And through the 2010s, bringing power to townships, so the poor um, residential areas inhabited by large parts of the black population, was one of the proud boasts of the ANC government. And if you drive past the townships, um, say on the way from the airport in Cape Town to the, the main city, you see the telegraph poles um, with the, the power lines running down to people's houses with satellite dishes on top of corrugated iron rooftops. So it's real, like power was actually provided on a dramatic scale, not quite to the extent it was done in India, but really rather comprehensively. And through 2008, South Africa was actually an exporter of electricity to the rest of Southern Africa. And then crisis hit. And initially, it was a question, I think, of South Africa having grown too fast in the early 2000s, and it outgrew the envelope. So there, there was a question of investment shortfall relative to demand, which was growing very fast. But in the 2010s, what has become clear is that for a variety of complex reasons, and I think you're right to say it's not really a market failure because ESCOM is a is a, is a public utility. And, and so this is a matter of political decision making and prioritization and corporate governance and malfeasance within ESCOM itself. But for whatever reason, both new investment and maintenance of existing capacity has been disastrously fallen disastrously short of what's necessary so that by 2019 ESCOM is struggling to keep more than about 75 percent of its generating capacity up and running at any one time which leaves it thousands and thousands and thousands of um, megawatts short of what it needs to um, uh, provide for the population um, and so South Africa's energy grid has been experiencing a series of escalating um, phased, crises, collapses, load shedding is a daily reality. 
Um, and this is driven by, you know, uh, just one, one set of problems after another. So fires at the power stations, broken coal conveyors, broken um, coal silos, um, nuclear power stations. They have a, the Coburg uh, nuclear power station, which went offline in the fall of 2022 because the electrical system tripped during testing. Um, and so uh, when I was there a, a week or two ago, the, the conversation was about the, the prospect of a near total shutdown of the of the system um, where where really you'd we'd be talking about a complete outage. Meanwhile, ESCOM itself, there has been a, an absolute crisis of um, of corporate governance with the CEO, Andre de Ruta, um, uh, essentially uh, resigning from his position under threats from within the organization. There's credible reason to believe that he was po- a poisoning attempt, an assassination attempt was made against him by um, the mafia groups that operate within ESCOM. So there were powerful organized crime syndicates connected to the trade union and the ANC uh, operating in the major coal regions of South Africa who um, see themselves as having a vested interest in this in this malfunctioning this malfunctioning giant. Um, this goes from you know large scale resistance to um, green energy as an option for the future, down to criminal gangs that systematically rob coal trains, repace the coal, the good coal with bad coal or even scrap metal, which then gets fed into the furnaces, which then sabotages and blows up the the power stations. The fear here, and it's a very real terror, is of what would happen in a society as unequal and as violent, uh, a society with as much simmering resentment as there is in South Africa if there were to be a prolonged and serious power shortage. And we have seen rioting in recent years, which has taken on the scale of civil war conditions. And while I was there, the insurance companies in South Africa actually publicly declared that were there to be a power outage, they were not committing themselves in advance to honoring insurance contracts on private property in the event of large-scale civil disturbance. So that is the kind of level at which the conversation is carried on in South Africa. All of this within a society which, unless you look below the surface, hmm. you might not think was really shaking. I mean, it's, it's a remarkably schizophrenic experience being there because it's a highly developed society with great internet and if you live in the more prosperous bits you know it's you have no sense at all of being on the edge of a precipice or or um or you know on the edge of a volcano but um the fear that haunts south african society of total breakdown is is dramatic it really is as I said, 36th largest GDP, and uh, yet the head of the national power company being poisoned by vested mafia interests. So that gives you a kind of portrait of the country. Finally, though, I wanted to ask about South Africa's relationship to other countries. I mean, should we think of South Africa as more economically integrated with its own region, or rather with the rest of the world, given the structure of its economy? And I guess more generally, what role does South Africa play in the broader African economy? Yeah, I mean, apparently by the measures of the so-called KOF, COF Globalization Index, South Africa is a, an economy which is slightly more globalized than the global average, which makes it significantly different to the rest of Africa, which on mm-hmm. the whole scores below the average on that index. So um, within the African continent, South Africa is... Um, you know, a standout case of relatively conventional globalization. And this goes to the same point that that it is a society which, you know, to the least superficial observer, seems like a very modernized, globally integrated place. If you're, you know, in one of the tonier bits of Cape Town, you'd have a hard time deciding whether you were, I don't know, down by the harbor front in Baltimore or in South Africa. It's or, you know, in bits of California, in fact. It's a very attractive place to live and very globalized. It is also the dominant power in its region. Um, so, um, and this, of course, is 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 a is a story with with long and and painful and violent legacy. Because during the period of apartheid, South Africa waged cross border warfare against neighbouring African independent states that it regarded as either dangerous because Marxist or dangerous because they were harbouring the ANC in exile. And so South Africa's dominance, and it makes up 
South Africa accounts for um, 70% of the GDP of the South African development community, which was formed in 2008 to unify uh, the states of the southern uh, region of, of South Africa. It accounts for 60% of the region's overall foreign trade. And this is a region which includes countries like Angola, which are hugely trade dependent oil producers. So South Africa is, as it were, kind of the whale in the bathtub of, of, uh, of Southern Africa. And that, on the one hand, creates opportunities and attracts people. It attracts labor to South Africa. It turns South Africa into the hub, but it also creates this problem of how you construct a relatively balanced community in which South Africa is not the absolutely dominant power. One way of doing that is not to structure these organizations like the South African Customs Union or the South African Development Community as pure free trade areas, because if you did, South Africa's weight would be completely dominant. Instead, you go for some more state-structured, intentional vision of economic development. And then those, given the nature of politics in the region and the difficulty in general of realizing those kind of projects, they tend not to materialize. So for fear of South Africa's market-based dominance materializing too dramatically, the region tends to shrink away from deeper integration. It's a little bit like the situation in South America, where Brazil's huge dominance also has put the kibosh on and made it quite difficult to organize regional integration there. One of the more dramatic and exciting developments of recent decades is South Africa's development as a hub and a driver of development, not just in the immediate region, but say up and down the east and west coasts. So if you speak to bankers at a bank like Standard Bank, not to be confused with Standard Chartered, which is a Hong Kong London bank, but Standard Bank um, of South Africa, they you know, see great development opportunities, for instance, in Ghana, in, in West Africa on the one hand, and in and in Kenya on the other hand, in, in East Africa. So that's another way, I think, of measuring South Africa's significance. And in terms of foreign investors in the rest of Africa, South Africa is really the, by far and away, the most significant African foreign investor in the rest of Africa. Well, I come away fascinated by South Africa, even more so than I went into this conversation. But I also feel like I've said that about every time, every time we've done one of these country portraits. So yeah, I look forward to the next one. I don't know. We still have a lot of countries left. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Twos, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TOOZE at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week.